All right, welcome everybody to AccuPlacer Math Crash Course Day 2. We're in Part 1. I've got Kiesia with us today. Can you say hi to everybody, Kiesia? Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kiesia. All right, let's 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 jump right into the questions. Well, momentarily, actually. But, but first, I kind of want to talk about how we're going to approach the questions today. Um, you know, this is, you know, we're going through AccuPlacer release practice questions. You know, a lot of these seem kind of basic, you know, but they do test you on some basic arithmetic and some lower level algebra and stuff like that. Um, but I want to practice kind of just getting into the logic of the questions and understanding what the question's asking us and, and thinking about it from a purely logical perspective, much less about like operations, you know, like just like, okay, here's one question and here's what you do when you see this, you know, it's about really understanding the questions. And if you understand the questions, then you kind of just know what to do. Okay. Does that make sense, Keisha? Yes. Sir. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and read this question. We've got a question on the screen right now. Um, that name is Xiao Ming, by the way. It's, <laughs> that's very tough to pronounce. It. You can say whatever you want to say. Um, but go ahead and jump into uh, question nine. The, the first three questions were from the homework from day one. And then we'll jump into some new questions after these questions. Go ahead and read that for me, please. Okay. Xiao Ming is making cookies. Each batch of cookies uses three eggs. If Xiao Ming has 20 eggs, and assuming he has enough for the other ingredients to make the cookies, what is the greatest number of batches that he can make? Okay. Okay. What are we solving for here, Kiesha? The, the greatest number of batches that he can make. The greatest number of batches he can make. Okay. I really want to focus in on that. Okay. Um, Got to understand what the question is asking us before we decide what we're going to do here. Okay. We're trying to find the greatest number of batches of cookies that Xiaoming can make, okay? Now, the temptation here, I think, is to look at, like, we've got, oh, we've got three and 20. Do I subtract them? Do I divide them? Do I multiply them? What do I do with those? You know what I'm saying? Like, people just want to kind of slap That's numbers true. together. You know what I'm saying? Don't do that. Don't do Let's think about this logically, okay? He's got 20 eggs. He's got 20 eggs. Think about that. Imagine those 20 eggs. And each batch of, cookie used, each batch of cookies uses three eggs, okay? So okay. if he had three eggs, just three eggs, how many batches could he make? If he had just three eggs. <laughs> and read the question if you need to. And remember, it tells us each batch of cookies uses three eggs. So was only one batch? So one batch. If, Absolutely. Well, right, okay. If he had three if he had three eggs. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Alright, what about what if he had six eggs? Then he can make what, six batches? Well, I mean, you tell me. <laughs> two, right? Does that make sense? Just on yeah. a basic logical level. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. What if he had nine eggs? How many batches of cookies could he make? Three. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Do you see, do you see how I'm kind of approaching this? Just kind of understanding the, the meaning of these ideas here. Yes, okay. sir. Now, if you want to, we can go all the way up to 20. I think maybe we should. Right? I'm just counting by threes. Does that make okay. sense? So, like, uh, let's do that. Okay, so we said if he's got three, three, three eggs, that's one batch. If he's got six eggs, that's two batches. We said if he's got nine eggs, that's uh, three batches. Let's keep bumping it up till we get to 20. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right. So, tw uh, let's say 12 eggs. How many batches? That's four. Four. Noticing pattern here, maybe. 15 eggs? Yeah. Five. Five. Uh, going up by three is 18 eggs? Six. Six. And then we would have to, to make another batch, how many cookies would he have to have? How many cookies? Or how many, sorry, how many eggs would he have to have <laughs> to make another batch? Um, make another batch? Yeah. Seven? How about six? Wait. Yeah, when you have to have six. Oh, no. That'd be, um, Hold you're good. You're good. Uh, Take your time. Remember, these, what, seven are, these are the number 26. of eggs right here, right? Okay, 20. And we're just going up by three. 21. You'd have to have 21 eggs. Does he have 21 eggs? No. 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 Okay. No. What's the answer? The answer is B. It's B. Six. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, here's the, the tricky part. You might be like, well, let's, you know, a lot of students are going to do this. They're going to be like, we has got 20 eggs. I'll just divide by three. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know what I'm saying? But do, do you have your calculator handy? Yes, sir. Do that. Divide 20 by three. 
What do you get? You can choose your iPhone. You know. Yeah. What do you get when you divide 20 by 3? Oh, like a decimal, 6.66. Yeah, 6.6. 6. 6. Yeah, so basically 6.67. Yeah. Right? And lessons would be like, oh, I'll just round that up to 7. 7, done, C. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So if you're just do, if you're doing operations, it's so easy to make like, just like, it might make a mistake like that. It's mm-hmm. just so easy. But when you think about it logically, you're like, let's just count up. All right, I know how many batches you can make with three eggs. I know how many you can make with six. I know how many you can make with nine. And just work your way up. Right? Okay. And then you realize, like, well, I can make six batches with 18, but I can't make I can't make okay. seven batches. That would take 21 eggs. And we don't have 21 eggs. We got 20. Correct. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Again, like, that's the logic of these questions. Right? And these, okay. these are released AccuPlacer questions questions i don't expect them all to be this easy maybe kind of at the start or something like that but but you can see a question like this and if you think about it in terms of math operations you're very likely to make a silly mistake but if you think about it from pure logic perspective and common sense perspective then then uh, then i think i think you're much more likely to get the right answer okay okay all right let's do the next question let me question number two for us please a club has 36 members. If each member donates 12 items for an auction, how many items will there be in the auction? Okay. Let's think about this logically here. Well, first, what are we solving for? How many um, items will be in the auction? Yeah. How many items are going to be in the auction? I'm going to underline that again. Make that really, really clear. Try to find the number of items in the auction. Okay. And each member in this club, each member in this club is donating 12 items. For the auction. Okay. Do you understand what that means? Yes. Yeah. And we got 36 members. That's Are we, that's a lot of members, right? Are we going to have a lot of items or just a, just a few items? A lot. We're going to have a lot, right? Already, already, I want to eliminate a couple answer choices. <laughs> but we've already done, even done an operation. What would you eliminate if, if you could? I would eliminate A and B. A and B. Absolutely right. It should, we know it's at 36 members. Each person is donating 12. There's no way it's going to be 48. Even 108 small. We're talking a lot, of, a lot of items. Now, probably now that you understand, I think you probably know the operation, right? I would just multiply. Just multiply them. Just multiply them. Yeah. Even if this is as far as you get, it's you know you you're just guessing it's going to be C or D. And I'll yes. take that. You're just you know you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know how to solve everything on this test. But if you can get rid of the bad answer choices, then you increase your odds of getting lucky and, and getting answers right, even if you don't know how to solve them. Does that make sense when I say if you can eliminate answer choice, you're increasing your odds of passing a lot? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. But I think go ahead and multiply them, see what we get. I think we'll find the right answer. 432. Yeah. For, uh, yeah. I, you know, I, <laughs> that's, I mean, how, yeah, you, you, you know, you multiply them, right? Absolutely. Yes, that's it. Any questions about that? No. No? I really um, recommend reading the question a few times over. Yeah. Read it. You know, understand the question. Don't just focus on the numbers and try to you know, slap some operations together. Oh, I'll multiply them. I'll divide them. I'll subtract them. I'll add them. You know, like, don't do that. You know, they're designing the answer choices, you know, based on common misconceptions about math and common mistakes. So, you know, if you add them together, you know, you get 48. You're like, oh, that matches up great. You know, but... Yeah, that's not how to do this. Understand what the question is asking you, and then you kind of know what to do. Okay? Yes, sir. All right, let's keep rolling. You're doing great. All right, so go ahead and read number four for us, please. A conference planner has put together 280 binders for attendees and another 31 binders for presenters. How many total binders did the planner put together for attendees and presenters? Okay. What are we solving for here, Keisha? How many binders are put together for the attendees and presenters yeah, together? Absolutely. How many total binders for attendees and presenters? And the thing you're solving for is almost always in the last sentence of the question. Okay, so you got to really understand that. This is pretty easy. This is pretty easy. Okay. But first, bef- before, before, before we find the right answer, and this is really easy, honestly. 
It's real easy. But look at the answer choices. All right, we're trying to find the total number of binders, and we know that they put 2080, two, uh, sorry, 280 together for the attendees, 31 for the presenters. Look at some of these answer choices. If you're going to get rid of some answer choices, what should you get rid of right off the bat? I would eliminate B and D. B and D. Why? Uh, I agree with B. Why B? Because, well, see, I'm, if I was to, because I know that I need to add. Yeah, you need to add them. So, I will, if I lined it up, zero plus one is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how I look at it. That's interesting. I see that. I see that. That's really, really good. I like that. I like that. And those don't have a one at the end. You know there's got to be a one at the end, right? I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. But also look at 249, right? It's, that's mm -hmm. that's less than 280, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we're talking about how much together. We know it's got to be more than 280. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But I like that too. I think that's brilliant. I didn't even, I've never thought about that way before. But absolutely, we can eliminate D as well. well. Anyway, is it A or C? <laughs> the answer would be C. You don't even have look. Stop, stop, stop. You don't even the have answer. to. Oh, my bad. I was <laughs> my What's it going to be? Uh, C. It's got to be C. I mean, you can add them to get, you can do the operation if you want to. Yeah, but then it wouldn't be A because it's less than. That's less than 280, right? How silly is that answer choice? Right. <laughs> Is it starting to make sense when I talk about thinking about the logic of the questions? Yes, sir. This is just common sense. I mean, questions like this. Again, I don't expect them all to be this easy. But if you're getting the ones you should be getting right, you know, the higher level difficulty questions, you know, you don't have to get everything right. But you need to get the ones you should be getting right, right, like this. And you can find it with, we didn't even, you know, we didn't even line them up and do that whole like middle school, you know, three digit division thing. We didn't even do that. I don't think I even want to here. We could. But we're just adding 280 and 31. But that's not going to be 211. No way. Any questions about that? No, sir. Okay. You're doing great. You're doing great. Okay, now I think we got some new questions coming up that weren't in the homework assignment. Ooh. Ooh. Now we got okay, now we gotta talk about some operations. <laughs> Go ahead and read uh, question number eight for us, please, loud and proud. Which of the following fractions is equivalent to negative six minus negative nine over eight divided by eight? Yeah. Ooh. 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 Okay. Okay. We got to talk operations a little bit here. Okay. The part that should probably be freaking students out a little bit. They're like, uh oh, I've got two negatives here, right? I'm subtracting a negative. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That looks a little bit scary. What do you do when you subtract a negative? What do you do? Um, it was a saying our teacher told us it was like keep change change so like you keep the first sign change the middle and change the last sign so I would just put a plus and a plus make it positive ooh I like that I like that yeah yeah, but, just, yeah, yeah. go ahead what were you saying uh, oh I was about to solve this problem never mind <laughs> <laughs> well well I mean no that's great that's great you know if you understand I mean that's the key, the key here right when you subtract a negative you're adding mm -hmm. you're adding Okay. And if you, it's helpful to think in terms of like that, what, you know, what you just described, that's great. Here's how I like to think about it. When you like subtract a negative or adding, here's how I like to think about it. Let's say that you owe me a hundred bucks. Okay. You owe me a hundred bucks and you don't have any other money. You just owe me a hundred bucks. Okay. So you've got like negative a hundred dollars to your name. You know what I'm saying? You're like in your bank account or whatever. You got negative a hundred dollars. If I take away your debt, if I take away that negative, right? If I subtract that hundred dollars you owe me from your bank account, if I get rid of that, I'm basically giving you a hundred dollars. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So when you take away a negative, you're basically adding. Like, I mean, imagine something negative in your life. I don't need specific details, but like, you know, bad ex-boyfriend or something like, you know, like <laughs> if somehow I'm able to take away <laughs> that negative from your life, I'm basically making your life better. Right? Yes. So when you take away a negative, it's a positive. When you take away a negative, it's a positive. All right. So let's, let's, can I see you work this out? Okay. On the whiteboard? Let me see you do this on the whiteboard. Okay. 
Are you on the on the pencil button on the left hand side? Oh, it's probably it's okay. It. Yeah. yeah. And don't feel like you have to write out the whole question again. You know what I'm saying? Like you know that okay. minus negative nine is plus nine, right? So just write that. Excellent. Ooh, you're getting good at the whiteboard already. Great. All right. So what do we do now? What do we do now? I will solve negative 6 plus 9. Yeah, and what's negative 6 plus 9? 3. That's 3, right? That's the exact... Negative 6 plus 9 is the exact same as 9 minus 6, right? Right. Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. You see the right answer? Yes, sir. It's B. Yeah, answer is B. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you made like an arithmetic error, like, you know, negative six plus nine, if you didn't, you know, get, you know, if you struggle, like it's not going to be negative. It's right. not going to be negative. So you can get rid of A and C at the very least, yeah. you know. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you do the arithmetic right, it's, it's obvious three, three over eight. Any questions about that? No, yes, sir. All right. Let's keep rolling. Oh, my. Number 15, go ahead and read this guy first, please. Which of the following values is equivalent to 5 to, neg to the negative third power? Yeah, 5 to the power of negative 3. Now, let's start with that word equivalent. What does equivalent mean? Equal. Equal to, absolutely. Equal to. Yeah, equal to. Okay. Okay, 5 to the negative third power. This is, this is a little tricky. I mean, you've got to kind of just know the right operation here. You do. Okay, and you'll see... Questions like this on the active placer. Um, let's talk about what it means to raise something to a power. Let's start there. Okay. What if I had um, what if I had three to the power of two? What does that equal? Three to the power of two. Nine. That's nine, right? Because that when I raise something to the power of two, I'm basically saying I'm gonna multiply that by itself twice. So that's three times three, which equals nine. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. What about 3 to the power of 3? What's that equal? Uh, that would be 3 times 3 times 3. So that was 9. Would that be, um, uh, what? I would say 12. I don't, I don't think it's well, well, hold on. You Look, it's just, what's 3 times 3? 9. 9? What's oh, 9 times okay. 3? That is 27. 27, absolutely. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, good. A lot of students kind of look at, look at uh, you know, that aren't super familiar with exponents, they look at 3 to the power of 2 and they're like, oh, that's just 3 times 2. You know what I'm saying? And then, ah, that's not what it means. It means 3 multiplied by itself twice. And 3 to the power of 3 means 3 multiplied by itself three times. So if you understand what exponents mean, it's much easier to solve it as opposed to like just kind of trying to memorize it or like, I don't know, just understand what it means. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. And by the way, I'm looking at some answer choices right now that I don't think are right, or at least one answer choice that I know we can eliminate that's kind of based on that common misconception about math. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Do you see which answer choice I'm talking about we can eliminate? That's not 5 to the power of negative 3. Are you talking about C? I'm talking about C for sure. Absolutely. We can get rid of it. That's 5 times negative 3. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So even if you know what, uh, even if you don't know what 5 to the power of negative 3 is, just look at the answer choice and see if you can kind of eliminate some answer choices based on common misconceptions about math. You know that doesn't mean 5 times negative 3, which is where they come up with answer choice C. There's no way that, that, that works. No way. Um, let's talk about what that negative exponent means, though, okay? And um, I want to go to the rules for math, uh, active place for math, real quick. Do you see this on my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, basic concept E, properties of negative exponents. Okay. They do like testing on negative exponents. Take a look at that, and we see that 3 to the power of negative 2 okay. is just 1 over 3 squared. 1 over 3 to the power of 2. So all they've done there, if you see a negative exponent, all you got to do is just flip the numerator and denominator. That's it. It's called the inverse. So you're still finding 3 squared, but you're just finding 1 over 3 squared. Does that make sense? 
Yes, sir. If you see a negative exponent, you're probably going to get a fraction. Hmm. Okay. So let's go back to this question here. So we've got 5. I'm trying to figure out 5 to the power of negative 3. Okay. We know it's a negative exponent, so we know we're going to take the inverse. Right? Flip the numerator and denominator. And it, right, so there's an implied 1, you know, underneath 5. 5 is the same as 5 over 1. Is that clear that 5 is the same as 5 over 1? Yes. Okay. So basically, we're just going to put that 5 to the power of 3 in the denominator. So we know at this point it's 1 over 5 to the power of 3. So far. Does that make sense? Yes. Any other answer choices we can eliminate so far? Just knowing that a negative exponent means you flip the numerator and denominator. Any other answer choices we can get rid of? Yeah. Absolutely. The, right? It's not even a fraction. It's just, you know, you've just, yeah, let's just, no, it's not D. <laughs> And it's not going to be A. How do you know it's not going to be A? Because it's 5 times 5 times 5, not 5 times 3. There you go. Absolutely. 5 to the power of 3 means 5 times 5 times 5. <laughs> okay? Not 5 times 3. You are absolutely right. You see, we didn't even solve for what 5 to the power of negative 3 is here. We didn't even solve for it. Do you see that? We just understood the question enough where we could get rid of the wrong answer choices. Okay. Now, you know, on your calculator, bust out the calculator right now. Go ahead and multiply 5 times 5 times 5. It should be 125. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So we can confirm it as the lead answer choice B. Focus on the meaning of the questions. What it means. You know what it means to raise something to a certain power now. Just knowing that you can get rid of C, and once you know that a negative exponent means you're flipping the numerator and denominator, you're taking that inverse, you can get rid of D. And just because you know that raising this to the power means it's, again, time, you know, time to itself three times, you can get rid of A as well. Any questions about that? No, sir. All right. All right. Ooh, I like this question a lot. I see a lot of questions like this from students. Um, this pops up a lot in the AccuPlacer, this kind of concept. Go ahead and read uh, question number 11, please. The Foley followed a recipe that requires two cups of water for every three cups of flour. If he used eight cups of flour, how many cups of water did he use? Mm. T uh, uh, Kiesha, what are we solving for here? How many cups of water do you use if he used eight cups of flour? Yep. How many cups of water did he use in this recipe? Okay. Okay. Let me teach you one of my favorite tricks with word problems. Okay. okay. Which is uh, whenever they give you a word problem, um, I recommend, you don't always have to do it, but in general, I recommend drawing a picture. Draw a picture. Okay. okay. So we've got a recipe that requires two cups of water. For every three cups of flour. Okay, so I'm going to draw two cups of water. Okay. And then every time I use two cups of water, I need three cups of flour. So I'm going to make three cups of flour. Right here. Two, three. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, visualize it. Visualize it. Okay. It's going to help you understand the question. Again, the key is really just understand what the question is asking you, not messing around with the operations. We don't want to get fancy here. You don't need to. I don't recommend it. That's how you make silly mistakes. Let's just understand it. Okay. Now the question says if he used eight cups of flour, how many cups of water did he use? Okay. So let's do this. Let's draw eight cups of flour. Okay. This is the recipe, by the way. I'm going to make a note of that. This is the recipe. The original recipe. And then now he's using eight cups of flour. So I'm going to draw those eight cups of flour. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight cups of flour, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we know the amount of water he's going to have to use is going to kind of have to be proportional to this amount right here. You know what I'm saying? We know for every, mm -hmm. every three cups of flour he uses, he needs two cups of water. If you were going to guess, just guess. Don't even look at the answer choice right now, but like, if you were just going to guess how many cups of water he needs, what would you guess? If you're just going to guess. Um, 
don't know. Come look at, at uh, the uh, Alex Way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just I'm saying, look at it and think logically, right? Look, is it going to be more than eight or less than eight cups of cups of water? Yeah. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this one again. Look at that one again. Do we have more water or more flour? We have more uh, flour. More flour. More flour. Not a ton more, but a little bit more flour. All right? Then water. So let's go back to this. We've got eight cups of flour. We're going to have more flour or more water. Flour. Still more flour. That doesn't change, right? Okay, so I guess there's more water. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, look, right here, we've got more flour than water in the original recipe. More flour. Right. Now, we're increasing the batch size, but are we going to suddenly have more flour than, than, than water here? We're trying to find the number of, the number of cups. Uh, Do you understand um, my question or not so much? Not so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Look, let's think about it this way. Let's let's do it this way. Let's go back and kind of approach it like we did with that um, eggs question. You know what I'm saying? In fact, this might be a better way to do it. Let's say, let's say he's got, he's got uh, six cups of flour. Okay. You could probably tell me right now how many cups of water he's going to use. We just we just doubled the recipe. Have you ever so, have you ever so, doubled the recipe before? A recipe is yeah. Okay. We need two cups of water. Well, there's two cups of, of of water in the original recipe. It looks like we've doubled it, right? Because we're doubled the number. I mean, of water. Uh, four. Yeah, four cups of water. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. This might be. A, I think it's a better way to approach it. Okay. All right. Let's stop right now. <laughs> Let's stop right now. Do you understand the question when I say, is he going to have more flour or more water? What's the answer, by the way? And the answer choice? Or... Well, just, just what's the, is he going to have more flour or more, more cups of flour or more cups of water? Just in general. I'm going to say more cups of flour. Yeah, more flour, right? Because in the first recipe, he had three cups of flour and two cups of water. And the second, you know, when he doubled it, he had six cups of flour and only four cups of water. Does that make sense? So let's look at the answer choices now. Already we can start eliminating them. Already. Already. What can we get rid of? Four. It's not four, Three. right? Look, you're right. We can get rid of four. Why can we get rid of four? Absolutely. Why can we get rid of four? I was looking at this scenario right here. Uh-huh. The, the second one where we doubled it? Yeah. 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 We know if he's got six cups of flour then he needs four cups of water. Great. But the question is asking us when he uses eight cups of flour. Do you see that? Yeah, because uh, I don't know. Water. So it's going to have uh, six cups of flour and he uses four, so uh -huh. it's going to be enough for eight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you getting into the logic of these questions now? Yes. Okay. More so. <laughs> it takes yeah. practice. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. They have to look, man. I've got so much beef with how math is taught. I got so much beef. <laughs> so much. Because uh, they just teach you like, you know, oh, just shut up a proportion. And it's like, uh, you know, but like you get to tap into all your common sense. You've baked cookies before or bread or whatever. Like you've doubled the recipe before. You made pancakes. You know what? You know how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. You know how this stuff works. It can't be four. You're absolutely right, because that's how many cups of water he needs when he's got six cups of flour. But here he's got eight, so it can't be four. What other answer choices can we eliminate with absolute certainty? Would it be D? Yeah, absolutely. We can totally eliminate D. Why can we eliminate D? Tell me why. Well, that's just too much. That's just too much, right? Yeah. He's only got eight cups of flour, and we know he's got more flour than water, so it can't be more than eight. It can't be more than eight. Does that make sense, Keisha? Yes, sir. Awesome. Awesome. What else can we eliminate? We haven't even found the right answer, but I know we can eliminate some stuff. <laughs> uh, I would eliminate C. Why eliminate C? Because if, um, 
go if I do. I don't think it's enough. Or that's probably too much. I want to look at A first before we eliminate C. Okay. Look at A. Can we eliminate A? No, I would say no. What? no hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Look at this one here. We, again, we've only got six cups of flour there. And already we have four cups of water. Okay. Do you see that? Yes. So if we're using eight cups of flour, there's no way we're going to get less than four cups of water. Right? We're adding more flour, we're going to have to add more water. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So just looking at this one, the scenario you're in where he's got six cups of flour. I know the answer is going to have to be a little bit more than four. Because I'm, I'm going to be adding two more cups of flour to get eight cups of flour to that second scenario. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So I know the right answer is going to have to be something a little bit more than four. Not a ton more than four, just a little bit more than four. But it can't be less than four. It can't be less than four. There's no way. So, so, the answer be C. so it can't be A, so it's got to be C. Absolutely. It's got to be C. It's got to be C. It's got to be C. Okay, so those um, fractions, they confuse me, so I just have to just block them out for a second. Well, you know, think about maybe, you know, and here, this is where you got to think about what it means. You know, think about what it means. I mean, five and a third just means something a little bit more than five. Okay. You know what I'm saying? A little more than five. Yes, sir. You know. And, and two and two-thirds means more than two and close to three, but not quite three. Okay. So think about kind of the weight of the values. All right. The weight of the values. Don't just look at that and be and think, it, yeah, I mean, like, it's, it's you know, you just got to make it concrete. You just got to make it concrete. Think about what it means. Any questions okay. about that? No. Okay. It takes, look, it takes practice to think about it this way. It does. They don't teach it in school. You know, they throw a math problem. They say, okay, follow these six steps. You know, sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. But if you understand it, you really understand what the question is asking you. You understand the concept. You're almost guaranteed to get it with just estimation and logic. Okay. Any questions about that? No, sir. Okay. Sometimes, and I hear some other questions, like students say the question, like, if X is... 2 and y is 3, what's y when, you know, x is 8? And it's the same kind of deal. You can just draw a picture and see what looks reasonable. And see what looks reasonable. Do you see why, looking at this second scenario again, do you see why 5 and a third is at least reasonable for the number of cups of water yeah. if, 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 uh, if the cups of flour is 8? It's at least reasonable. You know, it looks proportional. You know, we know we're going to have more flour than water, but not like a crazy amount of flour. Okay. Any questions about this? No. No? Okay. Let's keep, let's keep going. It's, I'm telling you, it's a tough transition thinking. <laughs> In fact, here we go. Oh, here, here we go. <laughs> this question was on here. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Great. <laughs> go ahead and read. This is almost the exact same question. The Good. variables x and y are directly proportional, and y equals 2 when x equals 3. What is the value of y when x equals 9? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. First, let's talk about that term directly proportional. Do you know what directly proportional means? The same? No. Like, They're not the same, no. right? They're not the same. It's not equivalent. Because clearly y and x aren't the same. Y is 2 and x is 3. Okay. What that means, what directly proportional means is that when you increase one of those numbers by a certain factor, let's say you double y, then you got to increase x by the same factor. you got to double x also. And okay. if you triple y, you also got triple x. It's just like the recipe thing, right? If you're making a double batch, you got to double all the ingredients. If you're making a triple batch, you got to triple all the ingredients because everything's got to be directly proportional. When you increase one, you increase the other by the same factor. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Same thing here. Same thing here. So we know y is 2, and we know x is 3. Here, I, for y, I'm just going to draw, you know what, I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw some dots or circles. Okay. 
y is 2, x is 3. 1, 2, 3. Little dots. We're going to count. Okay? Now the question is, what's the value of y when x is 9? What's the value of y when x is 9? So we've got that first scenario. Okay. Now we're going to make x 9. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Maybe you could tell me the factor we've increased x by. Maybe you could tell me. What do we... What do we... Yeah, what do we multiply x by to get 9? 3. 3. 3. What's going to be bigger in the second scenario? X, what's going to be bigger, x or y? Uh, maybe x. Yeah, x is going to be bigger, right? I mean, it was bigger in the first scenario, too. Right? Mm -hmm. And we just multiply x by a factor of 3. Does that make sense? Yes. I think you know what y is now. What's y? Six. It's gotta be six. Does that even look does it look right as well? Do those look proportional? I mean, x is a little bit bigger than y in the first scenario, and it's a little bit bigger than y in the second scenario. Yes. We just made a triple batch of x's and y's. <laughs> That's all we did. <laughs> That's all we did. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. And again, you're seeing you're seeing that you don't need to set up a ratio and a proportion, you know, like you don't need to set up deal. We don't need to deal with fractions here. It's just the logic of the questions. Look, you know x is bigger than y. You know x is bigger than y, so it can't be d because there y would be bigger than x. Okay. It'd be bigger than x. Then it's just a question, okay, what, what's the what's the fact, how much I'm increasing x by? Well, I'm increasing x by 3. Just, and you just logic, we didn't have to, we didn't write out a fraction. You know what I'm saying, Keisha? Yes, sir. We didn't even write out a fraction. We just understood what the question's asking us. And if you understand what the question's asking you, and what all the terms mean, you know what to do. Okay? Okay. It's a difference between, like, doing the right operations and understanding math. And I like the understanding math approach. I really like. <laughs> I really do. Yeah. I really do. Any questions? No. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. It's six. All right. Ooh, we got a little geometry here. A little geometry. Go read number ten first, please. Loud and proud. The volume of a right rectangular prism is found by multiplying the length of the base by the width of the base by the height of the prism. A right rectangular prism has a volume of 30 cubic inches. If the height of the prism is 6 inches, what is the, air, what is the base? What is the area of the base of the prism? Okay. Okay. Wow. You, read, you read pretty quickly. Oh, my bad. No, 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 no. no. I mean, it's, it's, don't get me wrong. Like, you're, it, it, being a fast reader is a big benefit, you know, when, especially when you have, like, you know, textbooks to shoot through or sign reading and stuff like that, or just, even just reading in general. It's, you know, you can fly through some books. Um, but when it comes to, like, how much of the question did you understand when you read that? It kind of just was like, woof. Kind of just woof, <laughs> right over your head. You know what I'm saying? I to, like, I got that sense. You were, like, kind of chewing through the words, but, like, none of it was sinking in. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I want you to read again slowly. And keep in mind, this is, you know, the AccuPlacer is an untimed test. You have all the time in the world. Okay. Right? So before you start doing, again, like the temptation is like, I've got a 30 and a 6. I'm just going to divide, you know, ah, you know, or multiply, ah. right? But that's where, you know, you divide them and you get answer choice A, you multiply them, you get answer choice D. It's probably not that simple. I could be wrong. Actually, I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't know. But, but I want to understand the question. So I want you to read again for me nice and slow. Okay. The volume of a right rectangular prism is found by multiplying the length of the base by the width of the base by the height of the prism. Okay, stop. Let's talk. we got to talk some terms here. Okay. Do you know what a, what a right rectangular prism is? This term right here. You know what that is? If I see a picture, I probably would know. I'm going to draw a picture for you here in just a minute, but I've got it on the rules for active place okay. math. 
think on the geometry section. There we go. Do you see that? Are my rules for math? Are you on the... Yeah. yeah. So it's basic concept I... G, third bullet point. Go ahead and read that for me, please. Read that third bullet point on basic concept G. Volume of a rectangular prism, like a shoebox, equals this length times width times height. Yeah, length times width times height, right? A rectangular prism is just a fancy word for a shoebox. Okay. Right? Like a cube would have all equal sides, but like a shoebox doesn't have all equal sides. So like the length and the width could be different, and the height could be different too for a rectangular prism. But it's a similar concept. It's like a cube that's just kind of stretched out. Like a shoebox. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right, so, heck, I'm going to draw this. I'm going to draw it. Okay. You know, I'm not expecting everyone to be like a perfect artist here, but boy, you should. I really, you know, when we're drawing a picture, I really recommend. Um, I just recommend drawing a picture if you can. Let's draw this shoebox. Let's draw it. And we've got one right here. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, we know that the volume is, you get the volume by multiplying the length and the width and the height. I always get length and width confused. I'm just, what is, what is this? That's the width. That's the length, and that's the height. So you multiply the length and the width and the height, and you get the volume. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, and in fact, I'm going to write that equation up here. Length times width times height equals V, the volume. Okay. And we know the volume in this case is 30. It's 30 cubic inches. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now look at the question. We know some more. We know the height of this prism. What's the height of this prism? Uh, six. Height six. Erase that. Six is the height. That makes sense why that's the height, right? Yes. Okay. And when we multiply those together, we got to get 30. We got to get 30. Okay. Mm -hmm. We got to get 30. Okay. Is this making sense now? Yes. Okay. I think we can eliminate some answer choices, like right now, that just aren't, it's, it's not going to work, right? Because we know we got to multiply all those values together and get 30. <laughs> what answer choices are not going to give us 30 when we multiply all that together? I know D wouldn't. D is way too big, right? 180 times, what? Right? Because remember there, they're asking us here of the area of the base of the prism. The area of the base. I guess that's the the, the question. What's the area of the okay. base? Okay. Do you know how to find the area of the base? The base would be like that bottom part right there. Do you know how to find the area of that base? Uh, would it be like one half times something? I guess for a triangle. You're thinking triangles, yeah. You're thinking triangles. Okay. That's just a rectangle oh. is all that base is. How do we find the area of the base? Would you? Uh, well, I tell you, let's go to the rules. Let's go to the rules. It's on the cheat sheet. This is up, man. I'm telling you, you study this, or you know, you can have this oh, lying okay. around, <laughs> taking. Yeah, I'm not saying to have this lying around, but, but <laughs> shit, were. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, follow whatever rules they're telling you. Follow, follow. But study this. How about that? Study this before you take the acupuncture. But go ahead and read okay. it's, it's basic concept G. It's the second bullet point. Area of a rectangle equals length times width. Length times width. The length times the width. Okay. That's okay. the area of a rectangle. You knew that somewhere in the back of your brain, right? Somewhere. Somewhere. Okay. You gotta study. You gotta understand it. So you multiply the length times the width, and you get the area of the base of this prism. Okay. Okay. And then that's where they asked for the area of the base. Now we know when we multiply it all together, we gotta get 30. Okay, so we said we can eliminate D. That's going to be way too big. I agree completely. What else can we eliminate? That's not going to give us 30 when we multiply it all together. C? Yeah, C is still too big. What else can we get rid of? B. And B. Absolutely. Now, hold on. Now, hold on. Would it make sense if the area of that base is 5 when we multiply the length times the width? I don't even know what the length and the width are. But if the length times the width is 5, the area of the base, would I get a volume of 60? Or sorry, a volume of 30. <laughs> a volume of 30. Would I get that if I multiply the length and the width and the height? And the, By five. Yeah. For, yeah. Would I, get, would I get 30 for the volume? If yes. The, if the base is five. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Does that logic make sense? Yes. Okay. The area that base has got to be five. I don't know what L and W are. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I know the area of the base has got to be five. Because I multiply the base times the height, I'm going to get the volume. Base has got to be five. But B, C, and D are way too big. If you think about the values. Correct. Okay. Okay. How are you feeling right now? Are you... Are you... Uh, do you feel like you're 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 thinking about these the right way now? Yeah, especially if I see a picture. Oh yeah. I don't draw the picture. Oh yeah, draw a picture, man. If you can draw oh it's huge. It's maybe one of the best strategies. I mean, other than you know the plugging in values, which we'll get to in day three and day four. Maybe the best strategy I can teach you is draw yeah. a picture. You've got to make it concrete. And then you know what to do. But if you don't understand the question in the first place, it's like good luck with the operations. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're not going to get it right if you don't understand. So you might as well focus on understanding it first. But when you really understand it, then you kind of know what to do. Or at least you know what's not going to be right. Mm -hmm. and sometimes that's good enough. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. We're going to take a little break here in just um, a couple minutes, but let's do some more questions. A couple more questions. All right. Go ahead and read question number for us, please. We've got some data analysis, it looks like here. But again, we're just practicing kind of getting to the logic of the questions and using common sense here. Go ahead and read number four for us, please. Robert sells four different flavors of jam at an annual farmer's market. The graph above shows a number of jams of each type of jam he sold at the market during the first two years. Which flavor of jam had the greatest increase in number of jars sold from year one to year two? Okay, what are we solving for here, Keisha? The greatest number of increase of jars sold from year one to two. Yep. Yep. Again, the thing we're solving for is always in the last sense of that question. So which flavor jam had the greatest increase in number of jars sold from year one to year two? Okay. Which flavor jam? Let's do this. Let's do some, let's practice some graph analysis. Okay. And we're going to practice this a little bit more later in the course and we'll see a lot more data analysis question, uh, questions coming up. But, uh, but let's practice right now. Okay. Here's what I recommend students do when they're when they see a graph or a chart. First, you know, you you got to you got to step back a little bit. Start with the title if there's a title. Okay, there's no title here. Often, maybe generally, there'll be a title. Start with the title, and then study the y-axis going up and down. Okay, y-axis going up and down. Ooh, there's the y-axis. Then the x-axis going left and right. Ooh, right there, there's the x-axis. Look for a key if there's a key. We do have a key here. Okay, and then lastly. Look at the data, the bars and the points on the graph. Okay. The in my experience and, and as a student as well, I mean like I would I tend to look at the bars first and the points first, but I don't know what I'm looking at. I'm like, I don't know what it means. I'm just trying to, you know. So just step back. Start with the stuff around the data, understand what it all means, and then when you look at the data, it's gonna make sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Sir. Okay. So there's no title here, so we don't have to worry about that, but let's start with the y axis. What's the y axis going up and down? The jars being sold. The jars being sold. Okay. Or the number of jars sold. Okay. The number of jars sold. And notice the units also it ranges from zero to forty. Okay. From zero to forty. It looks like like every little notch along those along those lines represents one jar being sold. Does that make sense? I say those little notches. Yes, sir. Okay. Pay attention to the units on on the axes. All right. They like messing around with the units, and sometimes it's not always. It's not always. Um, as it seems. So study and make sure you understand it. Okay. So it's ranged from 0 to 40, and one line represents one jar being sold. What about the x-axis going left and right? The flavors. The flavors of the jars. Flavors. Flavors of the jams. Absolutely, right? And we've got four different flavors. We've got blueberry, grape, peach, strawberry. Great. Is there a key? Yeah, there's a key. What's the key say? The light gray means you're one, and uh -huh. the dark gray okay. means you're two. There you go. Absolutely. Light gray means you're one. Dark gray means you're two. Okay, now so we understand kind of what's going on. I remember the question is asking us what flavor of jam had the greatest increase in number of jars sold from year one to year two. I'll bet you can just look at the graph now. Now that you understand the graph and you understand the question, you could probably just look at it and tell me what the answer is. What is it? Yeah. What is it? D. Um, that would be the greatest decrease. 
increasing years. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Um, uh huh. Uh huh. The answer would be, I believe it was blueberries. Blueberries. Answer choice A. Absolutely. Right. No operation there. No calculation. Just look at it. Right. We're talking about going from year one to year two. Light gray to dark gray. And the biggest jump is blueberries. That's it. Okay. Now you see, this is real important. You found the greatest decrease. Yeah. You found the greatest decrease. And the question says, which is the greatest increase? Do you see why the name of the game is understanding what the question's asking you? Yes. That's the name of the game. That's the name of the game. God, I don't understand what the question's asking you. I'm going to recommend you read these questions two or three times over. And for the vast majority of students, the same. Okay. You've got to really understand the question. Not what you, the impression you have, what you think the question might be asking you. Don't do that. It's not the greatest change. It's the greatest increase. The strawberry's not even an increase. Right. Okay. Do you see why you can't lose sight of what the question's asking you? Do you see that? Yes. You just can't. That's, that's what you should be putting your time and your effort in on this test. Is understanding the question. Understand the concepts, knowing what everything means. Not doing the right steps. It's understanding. Okay. 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 You gotta practice it. You gotta practice it. You gotta yes. practice looking at them this way, right? To not just yes. seeing, oh, there's three numbers in this question. I'll just multiply them all. See if something matches up. You know, <laughs> that's not how to do it. Right. Not, you take your time. It's an untimed test. Be thankful. You can take all the time in the world. You should. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a student email me recently. She spent like eight hours on a test. Dang. <laughs> I <know>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even. <laughs> yeah. And she was like, I had to go to the bathroom so bad. <laughs> it was so tough. <laughs> Let me look at the next question real quick. You know what? Okay. Let's do this. Let's take. Um, let's take a little break. Okay. Let's take a little break right now. Um, I'm going to pause the recording, and uh, we'll come back and answer some more questions when we come back from a little break. In fact, speaking of, that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good time to a good segue to a little break. Um, you go to, run to the restroom, grab some coffee. I'm going to do both of those things, and then we'll come back and answer this question. All right. All right. All right. Take a little bit, Keisha. Okay. 